the Bristol University Turing University Fellows Talks. Um, these presentations are part of a wider series of events being run by the Alan Turing Institute's University Partners Network. So we would encourage you to, if you're interested in these kinds of uh, presentations and these topics, please do have a look at the Turing website and um, take advantage of the other open talks that are on offer over the next few weeks. Um, this is in fact the first of many of our events that we'll be running um, uh, through the year and into next year. Um, the list of the other events both in the university and the other partner networks are on the Turing website so please do go ahead and register for those. The, all the presentations that you'll see today are the result of um, a year or so, two years of research, which was undertaken with the support of the Alan Turing Institute at the University of Bristol and with our partners. Um, and these were the results of an open competitive process um, back in the beginning of 2018. Um, each university partner had an opportunity to pitch for fellowships and projects, um, which would be led by those fellows. And so throughout the week, what we're essentially seeing here is a kind of showcase of that activity um, co-produced by colleagues at the University of Bristol and, and the Turing Institute. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we are recording this session um, and these sessions will be shared on the Turing's internet, internet pages. Um, so you may want to turn off your cameras, for example. Um, we will be having a Q&A at the end of um, the first two talks. Um, and we're using Slido for that. So Lily's going to put the link to the, um, to the Slido page. Uh, please do write your questions there. Um, the presentations will be around 20 minutes long and then we'll, we're leaving some time for, for questions. So I'll take a look at the Slido and share that part of the, of the proceedings and hopefully we'll get a good dialogue going. Um, if you could take, have a chance to take a look at our code of conduct for um, online activities, which again, Lydia has put in the chat, that would be, that would be great. Um, this event is gonna have three presentations. The first two are live, and the third one is a pre-recorded um, pre -recorded talk. So we won't be having um, Q and A for that session. So we hope to be able to finish this session um, bang on time for you. Uh, so let's get cracking. And first of all, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome our, um, our presenter, Kate Shields, who's working with Dr. Anya Svetova on a project entitled Data Donation, Personal, Health, Personal Data for Health Research and Policy Making. Kate, over to you. Great. Thank you, Kate. Um, share the screen. So yeah, as um, Kate said, I'm working with uh, Anya, who's actually the, the Turing Fellow and the PA, PI sorry, on this project, um, which is data donation, personal data for health research and policy making. Um, so I've been working on the data donation project since uh, 2019. And yeah, so this presentation is just to give an overview of what we've been doing so far. So first of all, just to highlight that the type of personal data that we've been mostly looking at so far is uh, loyalty card data. And um, this remains a relatively untapped novel source of personal data, but has a number of potential benefits for research. So firstly, in theory, sorry, I'm having trouble looking through my slides. So firstly, in theory, it's, um, it's an accessible form of data. So with GDPR regulations, the balance of who owns this data has uh, shifted. So prior to GDPR, it was companies who very much owned loyalty card data and could do uh, whatever they wanted with it. But since uh, GDPR was introduced, individuals have been able to access and download their data. And this gives a possibility to then transfer it to researchers. However, um, most supermarkets actually downloading the data is not always a straightforward process. Um, a second benefit is that in theory, it's a relatively inexpensive form of data to uh, obtain and use. So 
as I said, with GDPR, the, um, the stores are required now to enable consumers to download their data in machine readable format. And then in theory, this can be easily transferred to researchers. Oh, sorry, it's not a... Sorry about this. <laughs> I froze in the PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah, okay. So a third benefit of using this uh, data is it can enhance traditional measures of recording purchasing behaviours. So for instance, um, research into diet has traditionally relied on self-report, which has required participants to keep a record of their food intake in a diary. Um, this method of, is actually quite time consuming and it's often resulted in small sample sizes. It's also been uh, prone to reporting bias, whereby participants forget or perhaps choose not to uh, report what they consumed. Um, so loyalty card data presents new opportunities for research, as researchers can access information on the, the brand of the product per purchased, as well as the timestamp and the location of the purchase. Um, of course, it's not a perfect representation of what people consume, um, but it can help to build up a more nuanced picture when combined also with other measures. So how exactly can loyalty card data be used for research? So its uh, use can be broken down into two broad categories. So firstly, for understanding uh, lifestyle choices and behaviours. So for instance, we can uh, use this data to understand population dietary intake patterns, such as how many individuals meet the dietary requirements for fruit and vegetables and various other uh, dietary recommendations. We can also understand more about certain behaviours, for instance, if people are buying alcohol, are they more likely to also buy junk food at the same time? And so this evidence can uh, really help to guide interventions around healthy eating. We can also use loyalty card data to look at the change in behaviours following the introduction of certain interventions. So for instance, uh, researchers have looked at whether legislation banning point of sale advertising actually uh, reduced cigarette sales. Uh, secondly, uh, loyalty card data can be linked with other data sets to give uh, a more nuanced picture of what we consume and how this can be linked with health outcomes. So the most obvious example of this is perhaps to link uh, loyalty card data with health records. And this has the potential to reveal new insights into disease and diet, for instance, by looking at the difference in what is consumed between people who have certain diseases such as diabetes and those who do not. So just to give an example of a, a recent study, which has used loyalty card data for health research. So Clark um, aimed to identify dietary patterns and profile these according to their nutrient composition and socio-demographic characteristics of consumers. So they extracted data from almost 300,000 nectar card holders in Yorkshire and the Humber region over a 12 month period. And so only data from primary shoppers were actually included in this study, identified as those who had shopped in Sainsbury's on at least 10 separate occasions in the last 12 months. And they also had to have purchased from seven out of 15 food group categories. So this then helped to ensure that casual shoppers were excluded from the study. And they also extracted uh, geographic information from the loyalty card data in order to ascertain socio-demographic profiles of consumers. So using this data, they, they were able to identify that on average, uh, loyalty card data meet the recommended salt intake, do not purchase enough carbohydrates and fibre, um, but they, they purchase too much protein and fat. And then they found that the foods containing the highest amount of fibre were purchased by those living in the least deprived areas. So although there are a number of clear benefits then to using loyalty card data, there's been actually very little attention paid to what good practice approaches uh, for this type of research might look like. And also um, the public acceptability of using this data is largely unknown. So this is where our data donation project came in. 
And um, the aim of our project has been to investigate the most widely held public attitudes towards using this type of data for public health research. And we've also looked at publicly acceptable and ethical pathways of using this data. So there are three main studies that I'll talk about now, which have contributed evidence towards the development of these pathways. So firstly, the psychology of data donation study, which was uh, a large scale survey conducted by Anya and her colleague at Nottingham University. And then more recently, we've conducted two qualitative studies. So the first of which was with uh, cohort members of a longitudinal population study. And this explored their attitudes towards transactional data donation and linkage into this database, into the database, sorry, of the population study. And then the third study, uh, which we did last year, was um, a qualitative study, again, with members of the public, which looked at their attitudes towards sharing loyalty card data for health research. So in the psychology of data donation study, the research is aimed to explore the intentions and reasons to donate personal data for research. And as part of this study, they developed a reasons for data donation scale with 30 items querying attitudes for data donation. So for example, one item was, I would feel positive after donating my loyalty card data for research. And just over a thousand participants completed the questionnaire with 54% uh, of participants indicating that they were likely to donate their data and 31% not likely to donate. And they found that social duty was the strongest predictor of the intention to donate personal data, while understanding the purpose of data donation also uh, positively predict the intention to donate. However, a self-serving motive, motive showed a negative association with intentions to donate personal data. So hopefully then researchers can use evidence like this to encourage people to donate data in the future by targeting these kind of motivations. So for instance, um, research materials introducing any study should begin by emphasizing the value of uh, using loyalty card data for society and then explain how this data will be used. So in our next study, um, we conducted a series of three focus groups with members of the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children cohort, which are also known as children of the 90s. And we wanted to understand their attitudes towards transactional data donation and linkage into the children of the 90s database. And here we talk about transactional data as we also ask them some questions about banking records, as well as uh, loyalty card data. So Children of the 90s is a biomedical longitudinal study hosted at Bristol University with a generation of participants who have been followed for over 30 years. So in focus group part one, we introduced participants to different types of data, as previous research had shown that participants knew very little about their personal data. So here we asked participants to rank 20 different types of personal data from least to most sensitive. So medical records were ranked actually most sensitive. This was followed by banking transactions and various types of data that could reveal location were ranked equally third most sensitive, such as car GPS and mobile phone GPS and home address. And then loyalty card, as you can see, was ranked 13th uh, most sensitive. And focus group part two, we focus specifically on transactional data. And uh, so participants were given story cards, which presented the views of various fictional individuals which were involved with or potentially affected by record linkage. So here's one example on the screen. And this is actually the card that was commonly selected as a viewpoint that participants agreed with as they felt that they had uh, been con contributing data to children of the 90s since before they were born. So they were happy to share new forms of data if it meant that it could be useful for research. And they were also, um, they also mentioned how they had high levels of trust in children of the 90s. So this would very much influence their decision to share new forms of data. And then in focus group part three, participants were introduced to categories of data that the researcher would be able to view if they had access to transactional data. 
Um, so these are things like the timestamp, the location of purchase, type of product, and amount purchased. So here we find that participants were particularly concerned about sharing transactional data related to medication, also purchases related to their children, and also location data came up as a sensitive category within the data again. And then following this task, um, participants were presented with conceptual frameworks of how linkage could be done within children of the 90s. For example, we discussed retrospective versus prospective data sharing and opt-in versus opt-out consent. So from these discussions, then we conducted a thematic analysis, which resulted in the following themes and associated recommendations for developing a framework for data linkage of transactional data within children of the 90s. So we find then that there was a lack of awareness as to why transactional data is valuable for health research. And here we recommend that uh, researchers emphasize the value of the data and the purpose of the research for instance, in the research materials. And we also find that participants need to maintain control over personal data sharing for research. So researchers may wish to consider to include um, opt-in consent lists of various different categories of transactional data for the participants. We also find that there are differences in attitudes to sharing different types of transactional data. So participants require then explanations for why they are linking, researchers are linking different types of transaction data. And also researchers make it, should make it clear that participant identifiers are only um, visible to the linkage organization. Granularity of the, of the data we also find could affect decisions to share. So here we recommend that uh, researchers emphasize that granular and disclosive data are only um, visible to study data managers who are operating in a trusted role. We also find differences in attitudes towards sharing retrospective and prospective data. So here we recommend an option to donate either retrospective or prospective data if this is possible, and also information uh, on the risks associated with both options, and also perhaps options to consent on either an opt-in basis or opt-out basis. And we also find, as I said, that high levels of trust in research organisations are crucial. So here, participants would require reassurance that any external researchers using their data would uphold the same standards, particularly in regard to encryption and data, data security measures. So for our third study, then, uh, we recruited 40 participants to take part in semi-structured interviews and these explored their attitudes towards sharing uh, loyalty card data for health research and questions were focused on either COVID-19 or ovarian or bowel cancer as the proposed health condition to be researched and this is a study we've carried out um, in collaboration with researchers at Nottingham University. So sub-themes in the data were then separated into either attitudes or safeguards so under attitudes, we find that participants were mostly positive about donating their loyalty card data because of the force for good. And then this reflects findings from our previous study, the psychology of data donation study, whereby we find social duty was also the strongest prediction of intention to donate loyalty card data. And secondly, whilst participants were often confused initially as to how loyalty card data could be used for research, um, we find that with a brief background into this type of research, they quickly understood and appreciated its value. And this then led to more positive attitudes towards donating this data. So here you can see a quote from someone who was answering questions about um, relation to bowel cancer research. And we find that actually these participants were most likely to grasp the reasons for using loyalty card data. So perhaps as they could see the potential link between uh, what we eat and bowel cancer. And then thirdly, many participants were actually indifferent towards sharing this form of data, as they already felt that it was in the public domain, so they felt that people can already see what's in your shopping trolley, so it's, it's not private anyway. So overall, the change in research topic discussed in the interviews from COVID-19 to uh, ovarian, and cancer, ovarian cancer research actually made no difference to the rate of participants who were happy to donate their loyalty card data, so there was an equal number of participants 
participants, so 50, 15 out of 20 in each group were, would be happy to donate their loyalty card data. But however, uh, we did find some concerns that participants raised about sharing their loyalty card data. So firstly, they were worried about which organisation was using the data and what exactly they would do with it. So for instance, whether organisations were legitimate in using data for beneficial purposes, or they might actually use it for their own gain. Again, uh, location was a sensitive topic for around a quarter of participants, as they feared that uh, this data could be used to potentially track their movements. However, we find that participants in the COVID-19 condition were actually more likely to be prepared to donate their lo location data, um, potentially because it was easy for them to grasp how location data could be used for to benefit COVID-19 research. And there were also fears around safeguards for maintaining privacy and participants said that they would want to know details about the safeguards the university had in place for ensuring data security and uh, they would want to know this before sharing, deciding whether to share any data. And participants were also asked about their preferences for various safeguards and mechanisms of consent. And these were divided into three sub themes. So firstly, under control and convenience in data sharing. Uh, we find that more participants were in favour of letting the retailer share their loyalty card data directly to the researcher rather than through them. However, actually half of participants wanted to remove any data they uh, find sensitive before sharing this with researchers. And then attitudes on the choice of sharing data retrospectively or prospectively was almost equally split between participants. Then under anonymization and level of data detail, um, as I've already said, we find that um, a quarter of participants were against sharing their location. However, we also asked uh, participants whether they'd be willing to share their health status alongside their loyalty card data. And this would be to uh, give more insights into the link between diet and disease. And we find that most were prepared to do this as long as the data was anonymized. And then finally, under transparency, choice and data security, just over half of participants stated that they would want to select the health research that their data is used for. And then finally, a number of participants highlighted that transparency of the research organisation was the top requirement. If the public were to be uh, encouraged to trust researchers from that organisation with their loyalty card data. So we've now completed these three studies. And we are just starting to actually collect data for a final study with children of the 90s, which aims to gather uh, cohort member views on linking loyalty card data into the children of the 90s data bank for research, but after participants have had, actually had a chance to see their own data. So in this study, participants are first requested to actually download their loyalty card data from Tesco's, and then we are interviewing them to find out whether their hypothetical decision to share data might actually change after having the chance to see their data. And we're also interested in their experiences of downloading data and how straightforward or difficult this proves to be. And then we're also currently planning a series of public and patient involvement and engagement groups and workshops, which is, would assist us to uh, translate these findings into practice in different ways. So in the first PPI group, PPIE group, sorry, with members of the public, we plan to co-design a public facing website that would address the issues of confusion and concern that were commonly expressed by participants in our studies. And as well as the website, we are planning to develop co-develop co co narratives for five mini animations that would appear on this website. So three of these would be disease specific, such as diabetes, heart disease or lung disease. And they would explain actually how loyalty card data can be used for research associated with these diseases. And two further animations would explain the process of donating loyalty card data, also how the data is used for re research and the purpose of data linkage. We also plan to produce a report on the rights of loyalty card data, loyalty card holders, sorry, which is aimed firstly at supermarkets and other stores with uh, 
loyalty, loyalty cards, and this would inform them how they can actually present data portability opportunities for customers and then make it easier for data to be transferred to organisations for research purposes. And the report will also be aimed at policy regulators and will set out the rights of customers in this domain. Uh, so finally, then, we are planning to produce a protocol as well for engagement aimed at health organisations. And this will set out the steps that they should follow when seeking views from their communities about using loyalty card data for research. So we hope that this would improve the way in which charities uh, talk to their communities about personal data and the use of personal data for research. And this would then potentially allow them to access new forms of data which can be used to gather more knowledge on various diseases and to broaden their research activities. So finally, just to briefly put this research into the wider context, all of these outputs are leading to the development of a linkage program with children of the 90s. And in incorporating loyalty card data into their data bank should impact the way in which the link between human behavior and health is studied and also lead uh, to new insights into disease. So there are numerous examples of uh, exciting different types of research that could be carried out by linking loyalty card data into the ALSPAC data bank. For instance, we can understand more about how uh, liver disease is affected by alcohol consumption whilst controlling for genetic factors. And yeah, so please do get in touch with any of us if you have any comments or questions. Yeah, that's it, thank you. Okay, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, do you want to unshare and we can rattle through a few questions that have come in on Slido. There's been quite a lot of um, engagement there. So I'll just leap in if that's okay. Um, how does the research account for purchasing but not consuming? I'd say I'm a regular Tesco card shopper, but often I'm shopping for the whole family. Yeah, so I mentioned um, briefly that earlier, it's not a perfect representation, obviously, of what people buy. Um, but they, by linking it, for example, with a database such as the children of the 90s cohort, they can actually have a chance to perhaps contact those participants and ask them how valid the data is. I think there are also other ways that they they can correct for this, but I'm not really kind of involved in that part of the research. So it might be more of a question for Anya, who is um, kind of developing the linkage program at the moment. Great, thanks. Um, and the next one, you said that loyalty card data ranked as the 13th most sensitive type. Was this the least important or lowest average score? Any comment on the spread of views? So that was out of 20. So first was the most sensitive, um, which was, I think, that, yeah, uh, medical records was the most sensitive, number one. And so loyalty card was 13 out of 20. So it was more towards the uh, less sensitive um, part of the spectrum. And so what was the next part of the question? Um, it's now vanished from my slides. Oh, um, oh, any, well, was there any thoughts on the spread of the day? Any thought on the spread? Well done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I didn't actually conduct these focus groups, it was before I began, but I think, um, yeah, there was mostly consensus that anything like the lo lo uh, loyalty card data was already in the public view, so it was less, um, less sensitive because they felt that people could see what they were buying anyway, but things like medical records, very much private and banking, tra banking transactions, I think participants feared that perhaps uh, this could impact um, like any credit scores or things like that. Obviously those fears were unfounded, but they worried who could access um, what they were buying and they worried about yeah, any potential impact on their financial records. Yeah. Uh, next one. Is it possible yet to have ongoing sharing with the organizations collecting the data or do participants have to request their data and then send it to you? So we've not actually set up the, the data linkage process at the moment. So this project was just to really um, get an insight into participants' attitudes into whether they would uh, want to download the data themselves or arrange for it to be transferred directly to researchers. I don't think, I might be wrong, but I don't think at the moment they can um, arrange for it to be directly moved from say Tesco's to the university but I think this is something that Anya is working with um, supermarkets at the moment to decide on whether this could be like a potential 
way to share data in the future. And, and this is the question I was thinking of asking as well. Is there a particular demographic that use or do not use loyalty cards and are they more likely to trust organisations with their data? Well, that's not something we've done research into, into at the moment. Um, I'm assuming, well, I don't know really if there's a, I don't know if there's a particular, particular demographic, I'm not sure, <laughs> sorry. I'll move on then. Is there a risk of making assumptions about food items not being consumed because, uh, let's say, you know, I might use my loyalty card, but then buy fresh produce locally without it? Mm, I think that's something that we said earlier. It's not um, a perfect representation. But as I said in the, the Clark study at the beginning of the presentation, I think there are ways to control uh, for this for, for a certain extent. So they, they, for example, only recruited participants who had made, I think it was at least 10 purchases in the last year. So there are ways to see that people are regular uh, shoppers. And also they only recruited participants who had um, purchased from seven out of 15 food groups. So it kind of excludes them the least uh, regular shoppers. Yeah, and, and last one. How viable is directly accessing loyalty card data with permission? Is this currently possible or will you actually need to be looking at policy changes? It is very much possible, I think, with GDPR. So we can all now download our loyalty card data. As I said, it's not the easiest thing to do. I think Anya is telling me that Tesco's is a lot more straightforward than other supermarkets. So we can potentially all download this data and uh, share it with researchers. But I think there's a lack of knowledge generally out there that we can do this. So that's part of um, what we want to do in the next stage of the project is to um, yeah, let people know that they, it's something they can do very easily, download their data and pass it to the researchers. Great, thank you very much, Kate. Thank you, I think we can give you a virtual round of applause. That's one of the bad things about <laughs> online, isn't it? You don't, get to, you don't get to see the smiling, happy faces around you. But thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to get an insight into the project. Um, and very nice to meet you as well. Yeah, you, thank you. <laughs> Great, so we're now going to move on to our second presentation, which is by Professor Andrew Dowsey, and he's going to be telling us about his project, creating an open research data platform from the world's most intensively monitored dairy farm for tackling One Health grand challenges. Andy, over to you. Thank you very much, Kate. And thank you everyone for uh, attending. Let me just see if, great. Can you see that, Kate? Yeah, looks great. Brilliant. All right, well, hello everybody. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, Andrew Dowsey. Um, I, uh, it's, it's interesting really. So um, I'm, I'm a computer scientist who uh, works uh, uh, at least uh, a significant part of my time in Bristol Vet School. Now I'm, I moved to um, Bristol five years ago uh, and I've um, done um, a number of inter uh, uh, computer science and then data science activities in health research and drug discovery. Uh, moving to Bristol was the first time uh, working with the Vet School and in sustainable food security. Uh, and I hope this talk uh, if, if only one thing illustrates the importance going on of a team science multidisciplinary approach. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, this Turing project and the wider project around this about creating an open research platform uh, for sustainable food security in the dairy sector and hopefully wider implications uh, in One Health research. So. Um, Livestock production um, has quite rightly um, got quite a bit of stick for um, the effects with, with climate change uh, and emissions uh, and how it can be sustainable going on in the future. And certainly um, we've got to focus um, over the next 50 years at moving to a more flexitarian and perhaps in some cases vegan um, uh, lifestyle in order to uh, have sustainability uh, going on. Um, but in order to transition to that, um, 
we need to tackle this problem uh, with livestock uh, in a way that we uh, need to understand that there are parts of the world, uh, parts of the UK, uh, where livestock production uh, may be the, uh, the most sustainable or the most practical um, uh, and achievable uh, goal um, in the short uh, run, uh, particularly um, over the next few decades, uh, and maybe due to the soil in certain parts of the world, due to um, uh, other factors, climate factors, uh, it has a significant uh, uh, part to play. Um, but there are a number of uh, challenges uh, with uh, livestock production uh, in the future. Uh, I've talked about climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, obviously the farming practices, uh, um, uh, specific farming practices can contribute significantly to biodiversity loss, but there's actually ways in the future how um, uh, livestock farming could actually uh, regenerate um, areas of biodiversity. Uh, there's also um, um, how um, uh, biofuel production might be um, competing with the, um, uh, the, the food uh, that the livestock eat, and actually how do we get away from um, livestock eating foods that, that human could eat. So it's a very complicated uh, situation and uh, a substantial amount of research continues to uh, need to be done in it. And this is all within a One Health um, focus. If you haven't heard of uh, One Health uh, before, it is the interplay between human health um, animal health uh, and environmental health. And um, in terms of sustainability, uh, we talk about the three pillars of sustainability in general, uh, which is society, uh, society the environment, uh, and the, the economy. Within, within that, there is a significant uh, importance in terms of animal health, animal welfare, soil health particularly is, is very important. Uh, as is um, obviously society's perceptions, they're changing perceptions, um, skills of farmers, uh, veterinarians, uh, and um, the, the supply chain, uh, and I say it is a, it's a complex closed system. Um, another, uh, just as an aside, another um, really good example of a One Health approach is with the use of antibiotics and the, uh, the, the increasing threat of antimicrobial resistance, which we also do uh, a significant amount of research on in the vet school and also across the university. So here, obviously, humans and animals um, uh, take antibiotics. They might be selecting uh, for resistant bacteria. Uh, and this, through the environment um, and the food chain, can potentially um, uh, cause transmission uh, challenges. Um, so I'm uh, in the, in Bristol Vet School. Uh, we're involved in um, award-winning research um, to um, mitigate the threats of antimicrobial resistance. One thing that wasn't so much really focused on in those three pillars of sustainability, but is a, a clear um, pillar in itself, is is welfare. Uh, Bristol Vet School has perhaps the strongest animal welfare and behaviour group worldwide. Actually, we, we have a, a large um, a contingent of researchers and focus uh, across the piece. And it's been acknowledged at the government level with the, uh, the, the Farm Animal Welfare Committee, which is an independent committee that advises the government um, that, I mean, this is what we know. The, um, the UK is a nation of, of, of animal lovers. We can't consider um, agriculture to be sustainable if it's an, at an unacceptable cost to, to animal welfare. And we've got to take into account that farmed animals are sentient individuals in terms of their, our, our management of them and that we have a duty of, of care to the animals. So um, I've uh, been lucky enough to be involved in, in, some, uh, in analyzing data um, from a large uh, national farm assurance scheme that was um, the, the trainers were trained up by the University of Bristol uh, researchers and 
Uh, they go around every farm in the UK, 20,000 audits over a three year period. And just that, um, the implementation of the, sc the scheme uh, looks like that it has improved um, lameness um, and uh, other factors of, of animal welfare. And the, and the data itself, this, this talk isn't really about this, but the data is quite um, interesting in terms of, of um, um, looking and seeing what's happening, but also um, noting, for instance, that lameness um, is, is uh, variable depending on the size of the herd. Um, and the, the, the seasonality, this kind of thing. So back on topic. Um, I'm particularly interested as I've, I've worked uh, a, a fair bit in the past and one of the most important things uh, to, to help us in, in these challenges is uh, what's called precision livestock farming, the use of sensors and big data um, to uh, inform uh, what is going on in, in livestock farming. Now, um, significant proportion uh, of, of these, uh, I've got some examples here on the screen, um, are obviously commercial or commercially driven devices. Farmers want to know, um, uh, attach GPS to their animals, so they want to know how the space uh, in their fields is being utilized, for instance. Uh, they, they'd love to know the activity of the animals. Maybe they can, um, uh, that there's, there's systems out there for early detection of diseases, uh, pregnancy, um, things like this, um, that is very helpful from a, a management as well as a welfare situation. Uh, there's been some research um, in, welfare, uh, in uh, depth cameras um, for, for looking at body condition, um, lameness, this, this kind of thing. And, and um, essentially, um, there's a lot of exciting research focusing on various um, animal health uh, and welfare. Uh, what we wanted to do was to take a step back from this, because a lot of these are, are performed um, you know, with, a, with a focus, um, and they don't really act or play well um, together necessarily. They don't interface uh, together. How can we use a whole range of, of these approaches to answer some of the, uh, or at least try to answer some of the bigger One Health challenges that I've discussed on um, previous slides. So this is what we are trying to do at Bristol Veterinary School. The, the vet school itself is uh, about 16 miles outside of Bristol, uh, near the Mendips, uh, the campus there in the top right. Uh, and we have a, a dairy farm with 185 head of cattle that is used as a teaching facility and it's a it's a it's a commercial dairy farm um, and over the last few years we've um, received a, a, a significant grant to develop this and supercharge this for sustainability and welfare research so you can see this is the the main barn here the the milking parlor is here the cows walk along here and go back into the, the main barn through this, this race system. Uh, they have feeding over here and, and loafing or uh, general loitering down at the back. So with this um, grant from the John Oldacre Foundation, uh, we're creating the John Oldacre Centre for Dairy Sustainability and Welfare. So the main focus uh, that I'm going to talk to you today is uh, this is a schematic of the barn, the, the milking parlour that you saw is down here. Uh, we're put, putting in a grid of cameras so that we for, on the ceiling so that we can cover the whole floor area um, with video, potentially running 24-7, uh, so that we can um, potentially use all kinds of uh, computer vision methodology to track, identify, uh, look at the behaviors, potentially the social interactions of the, uh, the animals building social networks. Uh, and, and that would be interesting uh, for behavior research by itself. But the, the, um, what we're going to add to that is 
the genetics and the, the microbiome of each of the individual um, animals. Um, in terms of the uh, uh, genetics, you, you probably all know, uh, many of you might know about microbiome, but this is the, the, the gut bacteria and other uh, bacterial um, uh, ecosystem in the animals, in, in us, that actually has a, a large effect on, um, uh, in some cases, behavior and health, um, and is modified by feed, by um, a whole host of different factors. Uh, we're um, putting in and working in Roth Rothamsted Research, our strategic partners, to put in uh, hydrology and, and weather monitoring equipment. We're going to uh, link this to vet records. We have uh, these devices that are used at Rothamsted that will actually um, uh, sample the, the enteric methane production of each animal. They, they walk up to it, they get a little treat, and it measures the methane off their breath. Uh, together with individual feed intake. So all this together uh, is going to help us understand how the, the genetics and how the, the management can actually be um, uh, optimized uh, in order to optimize uh, agricultural uh, uh, sustainability and the welfare of the animals. So the remainder of the talk is on the specific Turing project. Uh, and. Uh, with, the, um, with the, the, the funding from the Turing, uh, we were able to fund uh, Will, who's in, in the center here, uh, in order to work on a deep learning methodology to identify or individually identify and track our cattle around our barn. This is a wider collaboration, as you can see, between the, the vet school, uh, myself, Siobhan, who's a, a, a welfare, uh, scientist uh, and the, the visual information lab the, in computer science uh, in Bristol, Tilo Burkhardt, Neil Campbell, uh, and PhD student Jim. And uh, if you're interested, the work that I'm presenting is being published here in, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this paper up here. So traditional methods of Cattle identification involve some sort of invasive tagging or the addition of collars. What we wanted to do is we wanted to know if we had a photo or video of a particular animal, which who, who that is, is that Daisy? Who, who is that animal? Um, and we can use static camera or potentially if they're in the field, we can use uh, drone based imagery. One thing we wanted to concentrate on first, because it was applicable to our herd, but actually it's also applicable to 60% uh, or so of all cows in the world, is that they have uh, distinctive coat patterns. And these act uh, like a fingerprint, just like our fingerprints, you can identify an individual by their individual coat pattern. Although I will mention that perhaps we have some evidence that we could go forward and ID without that coat line. So our work builds on uh, the work of uh, uh, Tilo and co in the, in, in, in the uh, uh, visual information processing lab in terms of uh, looking at an open set deep metric learning pipeline. So uh, how deep metric learning um, differs from, uh, from, from deep learning is this open set approach. And what that means is that we wanna train a system that can individually identify cattle, but we don't want to necessarily train, train the system with every single cow, uh, patterned cow in the world. We wanna train a system to be able to differentiate what, what is an individual cow um, but we could leave out a significant proportion of, of actual cow's coat patterns. So this is what the, uh, so this is what open set learning does. So the, um, it, uh, our pipeline is a, a three-stage process. The first is to detect bounding boxes of each individual uh, animal, uh, which uses a, um, uh, a convolutional neural network uh, retina net uh, approach. 
Um, and then um, we developed uh, the, the metric learning, which uses a triplet loss um, and an embedding uh, in order to, uh, to uh, essentially cluster um, through training individual animals into a lower dimensional embedded space. So this is a representation uh, of that space where the uh, red uh, rectangles here are um, animals that uh, have not been trained and they would, they would be projected in this space uh, in different locations than, than uh, other uh, individuals, uh, some of which were part of the, of the training. So the idea with the triplet loss function is that essentially you feed the system triplets of, um, uh, of examples, um, two of the same animal and one of a different animal. And you're trying to uh, encourage the space to learn to cluster the um, the, the animals the the, the 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 pictures of the same animal closely together and push away keep far apart pictures of different animals and then once you've got that embedding space doing a um, uh, a prediction on a new um, photo or, or video uh, frame is simply a case of um, doing a prediction with the model, and that will project um, a, that new um, image into the space, and you can use uh, nearest neighbor to, to determine which animal that is, uh, or a little bit, be a little bit more clever if it's a completely new animal. After a few images, it should create its own cluster in that space. So as part, uh, we're very um, uh, keen that this is all open and open source. So we put together first a small, uh, smaller data set called Open Cows 2020 that is available online. You can you can download this whole um, uh, training and test set uh, of animals, both using drones in uh, outside situation and with static cameras uh, indoors. And on this. Um, data set, um, we are getting with say an openness, meaning if we train with 50% of the animals and then we test on all the animals, uh, we're getting around 95% uh, uh, accuracy with this uh, cattle identification. These, um, uh, this, this plot here shows you uh, a, um, a representation of the, the actual underlying embedding spaces, I think 128 dimensions, but obviously we can't visualize that. So we use a, another dimensionality, a nonlinear dimensionality tool called T-SNE um, to be able to visualize that. And so you can see all through training to test set here. Uh, again, the red is the animals that weren't in the training the black are the animals that were, uh, you can see how obviously some animals cluster closer together because the patterns are quite similar, but still they cluster far enough apart that we can determine uh, what their IDs are. Um, more recently, uh, we have gone on and um, acquired a significant amount what, uh, of data. We have uh, currently one month of, of a continuous video from our um, farm where we've captured here the whole uh, herd. This is approximately 185 individuals. And also we have used a, a 3D depth camera where we can get um, a, a 3D information uh, as well as the red, green, blue. Um, you can notice that in this, um, uh, these lighting conditions, there are some uh, issues with, with specular highlights and, and other things, uh, but we wanted to see how depth may, um, uh, that our system should be able to just use depth as RGB. Maybe it doesn't work so well, maybe it does. Um, so these are preliminary results, and I should mention uh, from earlier, we, um, Jing and co have um, uh, 
uh, improved the bounding box detector so it's now axis aligned. Uh, sorry, not axis aligned, it's now um, um, uh, orientated uh, bounding box detector. Uh, that also means that we can start looking at whether the bounding boxes uh, overlap, whether animals are um, contact, uh, are they having affiliative or agonistic interactions? Could they be potentially transmitting disease to one another? Those so so that's uh, uh, as an aside and, and, and another thing that we could potentially do. And here is the um, visualized embedding structure of our 185 uh, uh, head herd, uh, and the accuracy is actually big, just simply training it with more data. We're, we're now up to 99.5 percent accuracy, which is which is really good. We think this is uh, more than enough to now use in production use. Uh, and uh, interestingly, just using depth alone, we're getting 62% accuracy. Now that's not brilliant, but it's given us uh, quite a few ideas of how we might be able to prove that and in future not um, need to, you, uh, to do this on cows um, with uh, uh, coat patterns. And then potentially it might even translate to, to one of other animal species as well. So finally, I'm going to um, wrap up with uh, some ideas for future work. Uh, we have an Innovate grant with uh, a R&D um, centre, uh, the AgriEpi Centre, Southwest Dairy Development Centre, that's um, um, it's situated not too far away in Chapter Mallet, or it, it or sometimes seems very far away because it takes ages to get there. Um, but they have this lovely, what they call a future farm, which is all robotic milkers, robotic feeding, uh, everything. We're, we've got um, a significant amount of data now from them where we're gonna look at, can we just train on our cattle and then it will completely work without further training on external farms. Uh, we're, we also have a PhD student, Ashish, who's just started last week. Uh, and he's going to look at developing this further for um, body condition and, and, and gait assessment. Now, the thing, uh, the key thing here is that the last slide I, I said about how ID wasn't was okay, but wasn't that brilliant using depth only. But actually, the um, the body condition of the animal changes uh, over time depending on how much milk they've got in in them. Uh, it can change quite um, uh, significantly over days and weeks, and we're not taking that into account. So future methodology might be doing ID and modeling uh, the, the body of the animal at the same time. Uh, and then finally, we want to go on further and really go to town looking at the social interactions uh, of the cattle, uh, understanding the, the hierarchy, because there is a hierarchy uh, in, in, in the cattle and, and how this affects animal welfare and how we can modify potentially uh, management of the farm, layout of the farm to improve animal welfare that way. So thank you for your attention. That's the end of my talk. Again, here are all the, uh, uh, all, all, pretty much all of this work was, was, was performed by Will. Uh, and, and Jing. So very grateful to them and the whole project team. Uh, and uh, just in the top right there, the, uh, the system was demonstrated on the BBC One show a little while back. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Andy. I'm, I missed that. I missed the TV bit there. <laughs> Shouldn't let me know. Um, yeah, we've got a few um, questions. Can you use your system of individual identification also to spot illnesses? So um, that's what we want to do. Uh, we were going to develop classifiers um, for, for that. Um, we, in, in order to do that, we, we need um, high quality annotations or, or, or other ways of uh, understanding uh, when the animal is is ill and at what stage of the illness uh, it is at, um, uh, potentially we could, when when an animal is diagnosed, we could look backwards through the the longitudinal data sets we have, days, weeks, and see if potentially we can pick up 
uh, an early diagnosis. And, and yes, this is important for some pretty uh, endemic diseases such as mastitis and lameness. And this is just a question of my own, really. Could, could, does that extend also to thinking about growth? So could it could it can be used as a base of the predictive modeling of potential growth in individuals? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And there is um, some um, uh, precision livestock farming focus on actually doing that. So looking at calves, looking at um, other species and and how they are uh, developing uh, and, and growth for 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 commercial reasons, but no, ab absolutely, that, that would be, uh, that, that's also very exciting. And what do you think are the biggest challenges for rolling this out into the commercial sector that we need to overcome to kind of, to leave the most benefit out of these kinds of approaches? Um, so, I mean, I think people have been working hard on the, on the methodological side I think the, the main, um, inter, I think it's the interface uh, between the methodology and the, and the, the, the farm, the, 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 the social aspect actually. So um, I think um, a, sig a significant amount of, again, team science research that involves social scientists looking at the, the behaviors and potential behavior change of farmers and, and vets in order to trust this data um, or, uh, and, and how they should use it and how they should um, use the, these systems optimally. And, and actually an, another part of that is there's still in, in this sector, there's still um, uh, uncertainty in terms of who actually owns the data as well. So it's, it's, it's kind of, um, yeah, the, the same kind of you know e ecosystem of challenges that the that, that, that Turing is really focused on in, in a number of areas. Really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you on behalf of everybody here. A round of applause to you. Thank you. Um, so we'll move to our third talk, which is a pre-recorded um, one. So we are very grateful to Dr. Oliver Davis and Professor Claire Howarth for having pre-recorded this talk. They're very sorry they can't be with us in person today, but personal circumstances make that very difficult. Um, but their talk is entitled UK Birth Cohorts as a Platform for Ground Truth in Mental Health Data Science. And we're gonna share that pre-recorded talk with you now. Thanks, Lily. Thanks, Kate. It's just loading up, we'll just do one second. Thank you so much for tuning in to our talk. Oliver and I are going to tell you about some work we've been doing to see whether we can use UK birth cohorts as a platform for ground truth in mental health data science. So we all spend way too much time on our phones, but in doing so, we are actually helping science because we are leaving this trail of information about what we've been doing, how we've been feeling and, and who we've been with. And this digital footprint data has real potential to be useful for understanding human behaviour. But the type of data that we can get from um, digital footprints is, is really quite different to the data that's usually available in cohort studies. And cohort studies are studies that collect data on a particular group of people throughout their lives and they can include lots of different types of measurements like diagnostic interviews, medical records, questionnaire surveys. And you can think of the type of measurements that we're collecting in cohort studies as these blue arrows in the figure here. They're usually spaced at regular intervals um, and they are collected throughout participants' lives. But there's an awful lot happening between these assessments that could be really important for participants' mental health and well-being. And so that's where digital footprint data could help in providing this higher resolution data on participants' lives. But cohort studies also have a huge amount to offer digital footprint data, because if all we knew about our participants were these maybe small micro um, expressions of behaviour or how they were feeling or different activities in their lives, it would be quite difficult to make sense of this information alone. 
What cohort studies would allow us to do is to try to make sense of the data that we can collect through digital footprint data. They can provide this reference data or ground truth data to be able to validate the types of behaviours that we're seeing, the patterns of data that we're able to collect and compare those against um, gold standard um, measures that are used in these cohort studies. And so combining digital footprint data and cohort data is a really fantastic opportunity to introduce real scientific rigour into digital footprint research because we can start to validate and really make sense of the coding al algorithms that we are using with this type of data. And to do that in known populations, people we know a lot about that we've been following throughout their lives. So Oliver and I have this programme of research that is trying to do both of these things. We have been engaging with participants and cohort leaders to try to work out what would be acceptable in terms of social media linkage in cohort studies. And we've developed hopefully easy to use open source software for securely linking Twitter data. And we use this software ourselves to do linkage of Twitter data in one particular cohort study. The idea is that this uh, software could be rolled out to other cohorts and could be developed further to link to other social media platforms. The key research that's funded by the Alan Turing Institute is helping us to use this wealth of ground truth data to test algorithms that are used in uh, mental health data science, but also we're trying to build a, a framework that will allow other people to benefit from the uh, amazing breadth and depth of data that is available to provide this ground truth for other people's um, algorithms. So the talk today is going to focus on one particular cohort study, and this is the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children, or ALSPAC for short. Um, ALSPAC is a multi-generational cohort study and has followed children born in the early 1990s throughout their lives. And data has also been collected on these children's parents, and now these children are really no longer children, they're, they're turning 30. Um, information is also increasingly being collected on their offspring as well. And really the depth and the breadth of the data that is available in ASPAC is astounding. Um, and new data continues to be collected and will hopefully continue to be collected for a long time. So we have our wonderful ASPAC study, but what do we know about social media users within ASPAC? Here's a snapshot of some work led by Nina that's, uh, where she's been characterising social media use in ASPAC. This graph is all about frequency of use and it's split into five common social media platforms. And what we can see is that um, uh, we're all, well, these are for young people and, and young people are using um, Facebook a lot, like almost everyone is using Facebook daily and that's the same really for males and females. But we can also see across the different platforms that there are differences in the frequency of use and that these differences aren't always the same for males and females in the sample. So we can see that females in the middle uh, section here are using Instagram uh, much more frequently than males, whereas males tend to be slightly higher users of YouTube compared to females. And here we can see the mental health status of users of different social media platforms and just to be clear, this isn't an analysis of how social media has affected mental health. It's rather a characterisation of how the users of different social media platforms may differ. For example, if we look in the top right hand corner here, we can see the results for depression. And we can see that as in the general population, female social media users are much more likely to have depression than uh, male users. And depression is particularly high among users of YouTube. In fact, across these four graphs here, YouTube really stands out. And we've also looked at how uh, these different social media, different social medias and diff users on different social media platforms may vary in terms of different aspects of their well-being. And so we've looked at aspects of well-being such as basic psychological needs, meaning in life, life satisfaction, um, and general well-being. And if we look in the bottom right hand corner of these graphs, we can see that um, 
on average, this is a, a general well-being scale, the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale, and we can see that on average males uh, have a higher well-being than females, and we can see that in particular male users of Instagram seem to have the highest well-being. So these results have shown us that uh, male and female users uh, are using social media differently and that the populations using each social media site are different. And so this means that we shouldn't, we should be really careful about the ways in which we make comparisons across different social media platforms. And this is actually one aspect uh, in which using cohort studies to provide the ground truth is really useful because when we have that ground truth data, when we know who the people are behind those tweets or behind those posts on different social media sites, we can uh, account for those potential biases in our data sets. Uh, the results here have also shown that results uh, may vary for different well-being measures, so we should be really careful about being specific about what different aspects of well-being we are trying to measure using um, digital footprint data. Okay, so we decided that we were interested in trying to link social media data to cohort studies. And really, the first place you should start is asking participants what they think about doing this. Um, and Nina's written a, a lovely paper describing our work um, in conducting uh, focus groups with uh, participants from the, um, the Ausback study. And in general, participants were really very willing to share any type of digital footprint data with Ausback. And their participation in the cohort study seemed to make them actually more likely to take part than perhaps people who don't normally take part in a cohort study. Um, because they frequently talked about the trust that they had built up with the study over the years. Participants, particularly the young adults, um, showed really good insight into the types of things that we could do with social media data. Um, and they actually really wanted um, to help. They wanted to provide their data to researchers. Um, with the key caveat that it had to be um, anonymised. And so we worked with participants again to develop the consent pr procedure for collecting social media data. Um, we sent out uh, consent forms to uh, our Twitter users um, in Ausback and uh, this table just shows you, just a quick snapshot to show you that the people who provided their Twitter handles, who consented to the use of their Twitter data in our research, and they're shown in the right-hand column here, were very similar in terms of their demographic information to those uh, Twitter users um, in the Ausback sample in early adulthood. So we're pretty confident that we have um, got a representative sample of, of, of uh, the population we were trying to target with this recruitment. And we can also compare mental health and well-being status between those people who uh, were willing to give us their Twitter handles uh, with all uh, respondents in, in a recent survey in Ausberg. And you can see here for measures of anxiety, for depression and general well-being, the link participants in blue are highly similar to the results we get from all respondents in red. So those people who are providing their Twitter handles and are willing to, to con contribute that, that data to our research are highly similar, very representative of the overall um, Ausback sample. So we're at the stage where we've got participants to um, give us their Twitter usernames and we're pretty confident that we've targeted a, a reasonably representative um, sample of the, of the population we were trying to target. And so now I'm going to pass over to Oliver and he's going to talk to you about how we're, we're linking that social media data in Ausback. Thanks. So our conversations with cohort leaders and participants guided the development of the Epicosm software framework. This was largely the work of Al Tanner and it makes it easy for cohorts to run their own social media data collection. This allows them to protect participants' personal data by keeping identifiable information inside the cohort's data safe haven. So this is how it works. First of all, the researcher asks the participants for consent uh, and their usernames. The researcher provides the usernames to the Python tweet harvesting code. 
the harvester contacts the Twitter API to convert participants' usernames to persistent identifiers. Then every week, the harvester contacts a database to find the ID of the most recent tweet collected for each participant and requests uh, every tweet since that tweet uh, from the Twitter API. The harvester stores the tweets in the database natively as JSON documents. Then when requested, the database exports the tweet data to a text file and sends the file to the tweet scoring code. And then those scores are provided back to um, the researcher and the cohort database. So what can we do with linked social media data in cohorts? Well, one thing we can do is get a better understanding of the performance of social media coding algorithms. For example, if we're looking to infer mental health based on online behaviour, we can tell how well the scores derived from the algorithm correlate with gold standard measures collected by the cohort and track how those scores change over time and in response to events. But this also works both ways. We can get an idea of what time period people think of when they're filling in mental health questionnaires by varying how much tweet history we include as training data in the models. What's really fascinating is the impact of events on how effective the coding is. So for example, the discontinuity in these graphs uh, coincides with the start of a pandemic lockdown. But we don't just want to facilitate our own research. We want to make it easy for birth co cohorts to act as platforms for ground truth for the whole field of social media research. One challenge with this is that social media data are by their nature easily identifiable. So we're exploring three different approaches to allow external researchers to improve their algorithms without allowing identifiable data to leave the cohort's data safe havens. So these approaches are Number one, bringing the algorithm to the data for validation. Number two, exporting synthetic data when anonymization is not possible. And three, privacy preserving machine learning on real data. So the first of these is perhaps the simplest. Cohorts usually share anonymized individual level data with researchers who then analyze it themselves. It isn't usually possible though, to anonymize social media data. So instead, why not provide a way for researchers to submit algorithms uh, for the cohort to run against the real data? The cohort can then validate the algorithm by providing feedback on its performance compared to the gold standard measures of depression, for example. The second approach is looking at ways cohorts can share data as they usually do. So although they can't an anonymize social media data, it might be possible to use machine learning approaches to generate synthetic data that share the important characteristics of the original data without identifying cohort participants. And the third approach we're exploring is privacy preserving uh, machine learning using differential privacy. This allows researchers to train machine learning models on the real data while ensuring that the model will not memorize characteristics that would identify particular people or contributions. And these three approaches might be combined. Uh, for example, it might be possible to use privacy-preserving machine learning to produce synthetic data sets that the cohorts could share to allow model training uh, before these models are submitted to the cohorts for validation against the original data. So before I asked, what can we do with linked social media data in cohorts? A related question, an important one, is what should we do with linked social media data in cohorts? What happens if we're able to make all this high quality ground truth data available and we are wildly successful in improving the general standard of what algorithms are able to infer from social media data? One of the aims of our Turing project is to consider the risks of success, whether those risks are acceptable and how we can mitigate them. Luckily, Nina and Natalie have come up with a brilliant initiative to help researchers consider the worst case scenario scenarios of data science. And we've been working with them to explore these questions. If you don't know of a data hazards framework already, I'm sure you will soon. You can find out more about the project at this link. We're also very lucky that Bristol is home to We The Curious, one of the UK's leading science centres. 
We've been working with them and the Turing to design experiences for the public around the question, can machines understand emotion? Here we are at a live hackathon in the exhibition space just before the first lockdown. Although it's been a long time coming, given the disruption of the last year, we're really looking forward to launching our Curiosity Toolkit there later this month. So we should all continue to use our phones too much and lay down our sprawling digital trails in the name of science. We hope our research will pave the way for cohorts to act as catalysts for more accurate coding of these data, leading to new discoveries and interventions to improve human health. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lily, for sharing that. Um, now, obviously, unfortunately, um, Claire and Oliver could not be with us today, so um, I'm not in a position to answer questions, I'm afraid, um, which brings us to the end of our first session. Um, but if this is this is pretty kind of piqued your interest in the work of the University of Bristol Turing Fellows, please do join us tomorrow for our next session, um, which will be on foundational methodologies. We've got another a group of presentations there, um, and I'm sure you'll find um, lots more interesting work to, to get you thinking about maybe the direction of, of your own research and how you'd like to engage with the Turing. So please do join us. And as a last thank you to um, very much to Andrew, thank you to Kate and Anya and all your colleagues that have taken part in the projects that you've showcased today. A really fantastic insight into the work that you do and the value of the work that you do. Um, and I hope will inspire other people to, to join us in our, in our kind of partnership journey with the Turing to develop new and, new and other exciting uh, ways of interacting around data science and AI. Thanks everybody and hope to see you tomorrow. Bye then.